Good morning, church family. Pastor Steve here. Happy Sabbath. I just wanted to share a quick worship thought with you this morning, so I thank you for allowing me to do that. Uh, before we begin, uh, if you would, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you that uh, we have an opportunity to lift our voice to you, to go into your word and draw closer to you, and to seek your face. Be with us now, lead us and guide us in your truth, I ask in the name of Jesus. Well, um, I hope everybody is having a, a good week. Um, I'll be honest, for me, it was a little bit of a rough week. And it's, it's one that sent me into the scriptures a lot. I've been bouncing around, uh, not entirely sure what I should talk about this week. Um, you know, it seems like everywhere you look, you are faced with the evidence of what the enemy is trying to do. There's an overwhelming sense of uncertainty and fear that seems to permeate everything. Um, the, the pandemic is the easiest thing to point to. You have people that are afraid of what the virus could potentially do to them or their family. You have people on the other side of that are afraid of what's happening if some of these fears are overblown and, and how people can use fear as leverage to potentially strip you of freedoms or privileges. Um, and you have the uncertainties that, that just come with financial fears. Uh, for, for me, this past week, it's been uncertainty and fear in, in relation to some health related stuff. Um, it just seems like overwhelming that no matter where you look right now, that's the currency of the day, right? That, that there's just too much out there to overcome that, that fear is what rules. And, and it's, and it's a struggle. You're, you're constantly, running into it. And so for me, I, I went into scripture kind of seeking solace from that fear. I, I, I needed to, to find something that, um, that gave me hope and confidence in the midst of all of the stuff that I see, something to, to orient me in the direction that I needed to be traveling. Um, and I looked everywhere. I've, I've been in Psalms a lot this week. Uh, the, the words of David, I feel like really resonate with me in, in the middle of everything that's going on. I've actually been in the Old Testament a lot. I've been looking at Moses, uh, I've been, been looking at uh, Daniel, been looking at uh, Elijah, and there's all these great examples. But ultimately, when looking for something, I, I keep going back to the words of Jesus. That, that seems to be the thing that brings me the most comfort, the thing that gives me the most peace, the thing that just connects me to God in the most meaningful way. And there's so much to choose from there too, like where do you go? But I was drawn towards his words right at the end of his ministry when he was speaking with his disciples at the Last Supper. So right before he's about to be crucified. And, and there's so much there. I, so I, I went to the book of John and, and if you've been there before, you know that there's, there's quite a lot of content to draw from. Um, and he spends essentially one, two, three, four chapters uh, pouring out his heart to his disciples, encouraging them because he knows what's about to happen. And he knows the profound effect that's going to have on them. And at the outset of that, the struggle that they're going to have dealing with uncertainty and fear because the world that they have known is crumbling around them. The reality that they had gotten used to is forever changed. They thought that he would be ascending as a king and he's going to be taken from them tried illegally, beaten, mocked, and then murdered in front of them. And it's gonna fundamentally alter 
what they thought they knew about the future. And he knows that's going to be a difficult prospect for them to, to wrestle with. And so he's going out of his way to say, you know, it's, it, he's, he's talking very plainly with them. He's going out of his way to say, look, this is what's going to happen. The reality is, is I'm going to be broken for you. I'm, I'm going to bleed for you. And it's necessary for me to sacrifice myself for you to have the opportunity to be reconnected with God. This, my death is necessary to overcome sin, to pay its cost. And it seems to kind of be sinking in, but he's saying things like, you know, it's good for you that I go. And they're like, why? How is that a, a possibility? It's good for you that I go. He's like, I'm going to send another, a helper. He's explaining that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And they seem to sort of begin to get it, but they're still struggling. Um, and so he's talking to them about all these things. And, and I, I was drawn to chapter 16 in John. And I just want to share with you really quick what he says at the end of chapter 16, because it really, I think, helped me a lot. And I'm going to begin in verse 25. And Jesus says, I have said all these things, speaking to all the different things about the Holy Spirit and what's coming. So I've said all these things to you in figures of speech, but the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. And his disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And we'll stop right there for a second. And I just, I find it like the light bulb starts to go on. But like I said, Jesus has been very upfront with them for a while now. This is not the first time that he has spoken plainly with them, but it seems to be the first time that it's really sinking in that the stuff that he said before was not figurative. He's told them on multiple occasions that the reason they were going to Jerusalem was so that he would give himself up to die for our sins. He's told them plainly that he would be crucified, but that he would also rise again. He's laid all this stuff out. He just came like a week and a half before, maybe not even that long, just a little over a week ago from, from raising Lazarus from the dead and using that as an opportunity to reiterate the fact that he had power over death. They've seen him raise people. And so when he tells them plainly that I'm going to die, but I will rise again, he's told them over and over, it's, this is a necessary thing, but it's not the end of it all. And I think that it just, it wasn't clicking. And from the way that I read all these things, the reason that he needs to continuously remind his disciples and go over this again and again is because they've built up in their head this preconception that what he's saying is going to fit this narrative that they've already sort of written. The biggest example would be Judas, right? The whole reason that he did what he did was so that he could force Jesus' hand, so that he would have to act and ascend to the throne. And he did it for selfish reasons because he wanted to be close to the source of power. So when he sees it not work the way he does it, he, he can't handle it, right? Um, but we've seen that with the other disciples too. Like they're not free from it. When he feeds the 5,000 and the people are trying to make him king, the disciples are not holding them back and trying to stop them. There's a reason that Jesus sends the disciples away in addition to all the people in that moment, because I believe that they are right alongside them in attempting to get him to take on this mantle of Messiah in the view that they held it should look like, right? And they're consistently asking him, can we be at your right side? Can They wanted to be close to that power too. Theirs was born out of a, a deep love and devotion to Jesus, but make no mistake, they had this preconception of what it meant for him to be sent from God. And he's trying to show them that this preconception that they have, while well-intentioned, might not be accurate. And he's trying to reorient them 
to understand the reality of why he came and what it is that he was doing. And so he tells them plainly, you know, that I, I came from the Father. You're right. I am sent of heaven. I am the creator God. That's one of the things I love about the book of John, right, is it does not shy away from leaning heavily into the divinity of Jesus. It, it unabashedly shows that he is fully God as well as fully man. And so he, he, he lays it out, you know, I am the creator God. And if you think about what he said to the disciples, there should be a lot of hope that springs from that as they witness what is to come. Knowing that he could, in a moment, speak and be free. Knowing that he could, at the very sound of his voice, render reality completely different. Jesus breathes stars into existence. There are no chains or ropes or bindings that could hold him, not even death. So if he dies, it's because he's chosen to allow it to happen. The creator God, the God who is all powerful, is doing this voluntarily. And I think that's what he's trying to get across to them. I'm doing this because I choose to do this because death is necessary to satisfy the price of sin. And if you pay that price based on the merits of your own life, then reconciliation is not possible. For forgiveness extended from the throne of heaven makes it possible. So I come from my father. I come from heaven to offer you this opportunity. And it's only because of my sacrifice that you have this opportunity. It's only because of my sacrifice that salvation is on the table, that forgiveness is on the table, that reconciliation is on the table. This is a necessary thing that I choose to do. And they seem to start to get it. And they recognize and say in this moment that We've seen that you know all things. They've seen the miracles that he's done. And, and, and as he's explaining this, it, it begins to click. And they say that we, we do believe that because of these things that you came from God. So in verse 31, Jesus answered them and says, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I've gone over that in my head a lot, especially the last couple of days. And it's a really poignant statement considering the current state of affairs, I think. I see a lot of connective tissue. The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. I think there are many right now that feel like that. The reality is we are sort of isolated and scattered given the current conditions, that we're sort of tied to our own homes in a way that has many of us feeling isolated and feeling alone. But that next couple of sentences, I think that's why it meant so much to me as I went to this, because it says, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And I'll tell you, I've seen that in action this past couple of weeks. There have been many of you that have shown it to me. Uh, I, I've had so many reach out to me uh, and, and, and be kind enough to inquire how I'm doing, to, to send food, which is so welcome for a bachelor who's adept at making waffles and uh, like oatmeal, and that's about it. Um, I, I've seen the love of the Father in action through you. And, and I want to thank you for that. It's such a powerful example of the love of Jesus. Um, I've, I've talked to many of you on the phone. Uh, I've had the 
opportunity to, to, to pray with you and, and, and to listen to the concerns and cares of your heart. And, and you've extended the same grace to me. And, and to me, that's what's embodied by that sentence that says, yet I am not alone for the Father is with me. It's one of the beauties of the church. It's not a building. It's, it's not just a place that we come together and worship on Sabbath morning. The reality is, is our church family is the fabric of our lives woven together with the love of the Father. And the evidence of that has been very upfront and center in my life this week. And I pray it has for you too, that, that we realize that we are not alone, that the, that the Father is with us, that we are in this together. And then comes the, the final kind of capstone of this talk and the verse that I have really kind of clung to lately. And that's verse 33 of chapter 16, where Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. And I'll be honest with you, church family, that's something that I have kind of struggled with lately. Peace. Uh, my mind is not a quiet mind in, in, in general. It, it, it tends to go a mile a minute. I've always been somebody who is kind of leapt from one thing to another, and I, I don't do great with downtime. I don't do great with quiet time. I've often been told, use your inside voice, um, or, or, or no, no, now's the time when we need to be quiet. Um, never a kid that could sit still, always had to be going, doing, talking, and usually loudly. So, even in the best of times, peace is not a word that I am intimately acquainted with. Um, but especially in times like these with struggles, it's a precious commodity. And so I love that Jesus says, as you look at his words here, that I have said these things to you, that in me, not that I have said these things to you that you may have peace apart from me, right? But I have said all these things to you, and, and, and I think this is a really big blanket statement that goes much further beyond just the, the, the previous three or four chapters with this conversation. I, I look at this in the scope of scripture, right? And as I look at all the different examples, like I said, David in the Psalms, um, Elijah and his struggles throughout ministry, Moses and his dealings with the, the children of Israel and God and his leadership, David like I said, and not just the songs, but in everything you see in his life, all these things, I, I think they're, they're all intimately connected, right, to paint us a broader picture of what it means to be loved by God and to love in return. And so when, when I see Jesus say, I have said these things, I am looking at the breadth of scripture, that everything that we have that connects us to the Almighty, encompassed in these words, that he says, in me, in Jesus, we have, may have peace, which means it's not even in the words of scripture themselves that we find the peace because the words alone, even unbelievers can take and say, yes, this is great philosophy, but the peace is not in the, the words or the wisdom of scripture alone. The peace is found there because those words and that wisdom point to Jesus. They put the spotlight on the one that deserves it the creator God, the God who humbled himself and became like us to connect with us on our level because he knew that we couldn't connect to him on his. And he's the one speaking. He's the one saying these things because through him, in him, and him alone, may we have peace. We cannot find it in our circumstances. We cannot find it through finances, through good health, through uh, bountiful opportunities through groups of friends. All these things are important and they're blessings from God. I am not minimizing them, please understand. But they are evidences of God's love and action that point us to the source. And that source is Jesus. And in him alone, in Christ alone, do we have peace. In the world alone, right? He says in the next sentence, in the world, you will have tribulation. And he's speaking to believers as well as non-believers. He's letting us know that even connected to me, there will be difficulties ahead. Mistakes will be made on your part. Um, the reality of sin in the world, even when you haven't made a mistake, you can still feel the repercussions from others' mistakes. And just from the fact that sin has been running rampant for thousands of years, 
you will have tribulation and being connected to me while worth it, while sustaining you, it will not exempt you from the reality and impact of sin. But that last sentence makes the difference, right? But take heart, right? Be encouraged if we're going to put it into a little bit more of a modern language. Why? Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Spoiler alert, he wins. We know the way this ends. It's not that he will achieve the victory, it's that he is the victory. In Christ alone is triumph over sin. End of story. That, as I dwell on it, that gives me peace. There's still uncertainty. There's still things that I struggle with. And there will still be moments, sometimes a moment by moment thing in the middle of this. There will be moments where I do feel connected and plugged in and good. And there will be moments where I feel scattered, where I feel isolated and I feel alone. But the reality is in those moments, even though I might feel that way, the reality is I am not alone. For the Father is with me. The reality is, is I have the words of Jesus. He has said them to me. He said them to us, right? And he has said these things so that in Jesus, we may have peace. And I know that even as we experience tribulation, even as we experience uncertainty and fear, that is not the final state of things that we have to experience. Because we will have it but we can take heart and encouragement because that peace that we have in Jesus comes from the fact that he has overcome the world. So I want to encourage you this week. If like me, you you might've been struggling. If like me, there has been some things that have caused you to to question or to wonder or to, that's okay. God's big enough for all of that. He welcomes it because it's an opportunity for him to show you who he is and how he loves you. And I want to encourage you to embrace that opportunity today to take all the things that might be causing uncertainty and fear and lay them at the foot of the cross. Say, Lord, I, I, I feel some kind of way, whether it's alone or isolated or it's connected or whether, whether you're, you're pleased or from desperation or you're lifting up your voice in praise, however it is, I invite you to join me today as we come together and connect with the source of all things, the creator of all things. And the reason that we can have peace, Jesus, because he has reconciled us. He has bought us with the price, his precious blood. He has set us free from the tribulation of the world. He has given us his life so that we can have peace, so that we can have assurance in that salvation that he's provided, so that we can know he has overcome the world. I wanna encourage you with that thought this week. I wanna wanna just encourage you to join me in surrendering your life to him in this moment. If you would like to do that, I invite you to join me now as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you you love us the way that you do. We thank you that even in moments of uncertainty and fear, even when we feel disconnected or we feel like our faith isn't strong enough, you're bigger than our feelings. You're the reality that we have to hold on to in in moments of uncertainty. You are the victory over sin. You are the reconciliation and the forgiveness that that is bigger than anything that we've done in our lives. You are God. And you say that in you, we have peace because you have overcome the world. Lord, we claim that promise right now and we take this time to surrender our life to you in humble submission, saying, thank you, Lord, be my peace in this moment. Be my victory. Connect us so that we can fully experience your forgiveness and your love. And we look forward to the day when that happens in the flesh. But until that time, Lord, sustain us, provide for us, get us through. Thank you 
for your willingness to listen and hear. And Lord, come quickly and come soon. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, church family, I hope you have a very happy Sabbath. I hope that your day is filled with the peace found in Jesus. Take care.